over the cloud. So TT, I've introduced you, but um, before we go to the question session, I just want you to add, add a few words before we start. Hey, um, can you hear me loud and clear? Yes. Yeah. So first, I want to thank you, Pamela, for the music. It got me into the mood. Like, <laughs> I, I think I was a little bit nervous. So like, oh, oh, nice. I'm on red locks, but the music kind of like calmed me down. Um, thank you so much. It's an honor. It's a privilege to be on this platform to I see it more as a, a conversation, having a conversation with a brilliant mind like Pamela. Um, I love what they do at Red Locks. I'm so eager connecting with you people all over the world. And um, I see your questions to be more of um, interaction rather than, you know, an interview because nobody knows it all. So I just want to encourage us all, like when you have contributions, when you have comments, even on what myself or Pamela has shared on today, just feel free to put in your contributions, your comments, your feedbacks. And I hope it's going to be a smooth ride, a great one. I'm so excited to be here. I love that. So <laughs> Without further ado, let's uh, kick off this interesting uh, session. Mm -hmm. So to help you um, all with questions, please go to, you can scan that QR code, it's much easier. Please go to slido.com and enter the code 2694105. So go to slido.com, enter the code 2694105. Once you do that, it will take you to a page where you can put in your question. So we're going to make it interactive, but there might be some questions that come up. So put that in there and we will have um, an opportunity at the end of the session to also answer your question. So scan the QR code so that you can get to Slido. I'll just hold it for um, one more minute. All right, so um, before I, I start to ask this question, um, I just want you to maybe briefly tell us about your tech journey, just in two minutes, how you got how you got into tech. I know you have a background in, in computer science, just like me, I have a background in computer engineering as my, for, my, for my bachelor's, right? So just tell us how you really got started in technology, right, and then how you, ended up landing into the space of business analysis? Yeah, so for me, it's um, it's not a common one because um, I always tell people it was like, I was privileged to like start the whole business analysis thing even right from, you know, when I was in school. So studying computer science, a lot of my classmates, they felt like um, they're cajoled or like pressured um, for lack of better words, into focusing on the programming aspect. And this is what, like um, how many years ago now? 16, 17 years ago. So you could imagine everybody thought back then was just about programming, HTML, JavaScript, C Sharp, and all of that. But I noticed that, you know, every time I we have the kind of like group meeting with our um, take home assignments and all of that, I find myself thinking more of, the process, like the process behind the system, behind whatever system we're trying to build, you understand? So I, I find myself geared towards um, drawing back then, we call them like UMLs, like the process, the real process flow, the concept, um, context diagrams and all of that. And I'm kind of like stuck in that space, like really putting in a lot of mental work. And then um, right out of university, I got into what we call the NYSE and that was why I met, I met someone, I, I wouldn't say was my mentor, but kind of like um, guided me and, and see the skill set in me and said, oh, you know that there's actually a part of technology, right? That, that, that's more about the, the logic aspect of things, speaking with people, getting the requirements in code. And for me, it was straight into, straight into business analysis. However, the first, um, the first training I had was project management before I then, you know, got into the nitty gritty of business analysis. And then I said, oh, in terms of business, I think I want to go into operations, project management. And then I had my MBA. And then when I moved from um, Nigeria to Canada, I just, it was kind of like 
although there was a waiting time, but I knew that I wasn't going to change my pathway. I was going to, into the business analysis of a thing. So I really didn't have the, you know, the ups and downs that a lot of people have. I know a lot of people, they started off like a, maybe like a front end, per, front office person in banking and all of that. So that's not my story. My story is straight into technology, straight into the analysis aspects, st straight into documentation, talking to stakeholders, interacting with people. All right, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. So it was, it's always been technology from day one. I think that's one thing we've had in common, being in technology from um the start of our careers, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And sometimes I ask myself, what am I, what else am I going to do? So I also keep on trying to evolve <laughs> in technology. And we'll talk about evolution from yeah. one role to the other. Okay, so today, um, let's go back to our topic about what is a business and analyst role in a scrum team. The reason why I bring this up is because for those who understand the scrum guide, you will see that the business analyst role is silent. Um, we're going to talk more about that, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's to clear up that confusion about what's the business analyst role, what should they do, why should they be a BA, if a product owner is there, why should they not be doing the work? Like, we're just going to, like, you know, tie a ribbon around this and bring that conversation to a close. Hopefully, we're hoping that at the end of today, you're going to leave here with more understanding about a BA's role, about why they don't really have to mention the BA's role in Scrum Guide. Scrum mm -hmm. Guide is a complete body of work. So we can't take it as a source of truth for Scrum, but we can't take it as a source of truth for everything that has to do with software and product development. Mm -hmm. That's what I always try to teach people. The mm -hmm. Scrum Guide is a source of truth for Scrum, how to use Scrum for product development, but it's not the full source of truth for anything that has to do with everything that has to do with product development and software development. So let's talk about how about integrating business analysis into agile framework. So how do you see the role of a business analyst evolving in Scrum teams, especially like I mentioned, considering that the Scrum guide does not explicitly mention this role? Yeah. Oh. All right, that's a wonderful question, uh, Pamela, and thank you so much for, you know, bringing it up on this kind of fro forum to address that, because I know that quite a number of um, professionals want to, like, kind of shy away from that, <laughs> from that bothering question, and, um, you know, in your, in, your, in what you just said, you mentioned the Scrum Guide. What I found a lot of people is when you hear a terminology, you don't sit down and look at a lot of people don't sit down and look at what is the literal meaning of a scrum guide. So this is just a guide. It doesn't say that this is a roadmap. Even sometimes when you have a roadmap, you are allowed to make some kind of like exceptions or customization based on your situation. So first of all, if we could understand that the scrum guide is a guide in the literal meaning of the word, then it's going to help us to have an open mind to um, how the BA role will be, you know, kind of appreciated in a Scrum setting. The second thing I would like to um, highlight in this discussion is a business analyst. Um, I I like to use more of the word business analysis than business analyst because business analysis is a skill set. Do you understand? So the Scrum Guide, what a Scrum Guide does is pinpoint someone who takes a role as a product owner, you have the scrum master, like the key roles that shouldn't be missing in a scrum setting. Like before you can say you have a scrum setting, you have someone who is distinctively, you know, identified as the product owner. That is someone who understands the product vision. That is someone who is accountable for delivering the product goal, the product vision, ensuring that each user story on the backlog ties back to what the product um, goal is. Do you understand? So that's the way I see the, not that's the way I see, but that's the way the Scrum Guide or whoever is, um, you know, accurately implementing Scrum delivers as a product owner, ensuring that whatever you have on the backlog ties back to the product vision, to the product roadmap. And then you have the Scrum Master who's like overseeing the Scrum team, ensuring that you're having your discussions, your meetings. And also you have the developers. Developers in this sense means that those are actually executing or actually doing the technical work. Remember that Scrum is applicable to software, is applicable to artistic performance. So imagine if the Scrum guide is talking about developers. 
you don't have software developers when you are doing an artistic performance. What you have is the people dancing or the artists or the people painting. Do you understand? So if we have a, an open mind about what business analysis is, if we're able to see it more as a skill set rather than as or um, as a role with boundaries, then we have an open mind to see how a BA will fit into a scrum, scrum, scrum team. Now, having said that, there are situations, um, not, nothing is cast in stone. And the reason why we have the beautiful thing about education, about um, all these bodies, all these standard organizations is that it's, it's um, all the documentations they have out there, they are living documents. You have the versions, you have the upgrades, you have the updates, right? So what, what I would say is that when a, B, when a product owner has a lot of deliverables such that the product owner cannot double as a BA, right? then you can set aside, nothing is stop, stopping you from setting aside a role, creating a business analyst role to perform the business analysis um, functions, to deliver on the business analysis aspect of a project of a product. So um, that's, so in, in a nutshell, let us have an open mind that the business analysis is more of a skill set that could actually domicile within whoever it seemed as appointed to be best suited for that for, for that um, role, you know? So um, in some organizations, the product owners actually, they actually deliver as a business analyst. But if you have a product owner that, you know, that's like sitting on a big engine, you have some complex pro products, for example, like a loyalty system, your customer lo loyalty journey using Salesforce, how does Salesforce interact with the e-commerce and all of that. You may want to set out a BA that picks up each of those user stories, each of the product backlog items, and then perform a proper analysis. You know that if um, growing in the business analysis, analysis world, what I realized is that sometimes you spend more time thinking more time in your logic, in your logic, logical thinking, more times looking at the schemas, like the data sets and all of that, than actually documenting. Because analysis, it's an heavy, it's a, it's a lot of work on your mind. Like you make use of your brain. You do a lot of research. You do a lot of logical yeah. thinking. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the kind of open mind I want to set out there. And I'm not going to give you cast in stone that, oh, you must always have a BA in the Scrum team. You may, you may not, depending on how the product owner wants to delegate that aspect of analysis. I hope I, I'm able to make some meaning, Pamela. Yeah, thank you. So I, I, you know, I really like what you said. So what I'm hearing from you is all about, is about, because we all know that Scrum Guide, remember, Scrum is based on the principle of empiricism. It's, uh, it's based on the theory of observation of mm -hmm. doom. So while the Scrum Guide itself is a guide, it, is, it always says, it is not, it does not say, say, it does not tell you like this is exactly how you must do it. It gives yeah. you a guide. And you always have to tweak it based on the kind of team the that you're on, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and what I try to tell people, right? Even though the Scrum Guide does not explicitly mention the role of BA, mm -hmm. let's also remember this Scrum Guide did not also talk about how the work gets done. Exactly. How do you populate your backlog? They talk about the backlog existing. Mm -hmm. Now, how information gets into the backlog is not something that explicitly called that in the back in, in Scrum Guide. It talks about who owns the backlog, but mm -hmm. we all know that to create a backlog requires a lot of work, documentation, meetings, analysis, data models, and all of that. Those skill sets are not things that might be available to a product owner, depending on the product owner's prior background, right? Exactly. And so a product owner really, if we think about it, is a CEO of a product. They understand the why of the product. Mm -hmm. They understand the cost customer. They know mm -hmm. what they want. They don't necessarily mm -hmm. they not be the best people to write how they want it. It might be in their brain. Mm -hmm. and, it's from, and, and a business analyst is a trained professional to help companies and organizations with identifying, like they want to make a change. They can, they can help to identify what needs to change in the organization, looking at the mm -hmm. current state and exactly. the future state and the gap between exactly. the current and future state. Mm -hmm. is the work that needs to be done. And that's why BA is coming. And you were actually giving a specific example. You've talked about, I was going to ask you, um, mm -hmm. provide a specific example of how business analysts add, add value beyond backlog management. You already talked about, like you give examples of like a, a loyalty system. Yeah. How they have to do that analysis. They have to look at the schema. So these are like, yeah. even like, think out things. Yeah. 
a product owner might not necessarily have the ability to do. Are there any other examples that you can think of? Um, I mean, there are, um, I want to say there are a million examples, not from me, but I mean, all over the world, like all over Google. Um, one thing I've learned a lot is there are a lot of information around us, right? We don't have, you don't have to sit in this session for you to see all the examples. Even on Google, you can get some case studies. There are a lot of examples. Another one I could think of from the top of my head is, for example, in a payment system, a point of sale application, right? And um, there is a requirement, so there's a new requirement that it's maybe like a compliance requirement that the receipts, the receipts that customers get from the point of sale has to have a particular information for the customers. Maybe their savings or let's say, um, recycling fees or whatever it is from the top of the uh, of the product owner so imagine myself in a product owner's role my 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 vision or my drive every day will be how soon can we make up with this compliance requirements like we need the organization has to be compliant or the product the point of sale application has to be compliant with these requirements and at the top of my head i'm thinking of oh how do we get this information on the receipt? Is it going to be at the top left corner? Is it going to be at the top right corner? Where is it going to be visible? Where is it going to be visible for the customer? So as a product owner, all I may be able to provide is like probably like a mock-up of the receipt, right? And I'm telling you, this is where this information has to be so that it can be obvious, so that it can be um, visible for, you know, for the customer. But then as a business, and now going back to the business analyst, let's, um, let's imagine that it's not the same person now. I'm, I'm now the business analyst for that kind of project. What I will do is sit with the owners of maybe the schemas of the, of the data set, of the um, data tables that will be interacting with each other. And I'm thinking, do we even have fields, existing fields that will accommodate this information? So as a business analyst, that's where you start doing your analysis that mm, system A is actually speaking to system B to give out this information. But at the moment, we don't have a field that will contain that information. Or at the moment, we have a field that will contain that information. And then all we have to do is just to display, right? So it's a business analysis that would do like the nitty gritty analysis of delivering on that user story. If you get what I mean, and if you like, if I'm, if it sounds like a little bit of a complex you know, or a confusion, yeah, you can give us, can give us direct, direct questions. Direct Sorry, questions. I'm having some echoes. I'm Am I the only one? Somebody now. Okay, yeah. So you could you you could ask specific questions so I don't confuse you. Yeah. So, so I, I'll I'll help you summarize. You've mm -hmm. just basically said how the business analyst, how we always talk about the business analyst being the bridge. Mm between the mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. and technology because exactly. you just what you just basically you know people here and they're like okay i want to be a business analyst because i <laughs> they say i will be a bridge between business and technology and technology how? you basically told them you've actually gone into a specific use example case yes of how that happens exactly i'm a business person i mean i'm a tech person but i'm also mm -hmm. a business owner right yeah and i also have a team that builds stuff for me like websites yeah. landing yeah. pages and all of that I have a vision of what I want and I mm -hmm. tell them, but yeah. I don't know how I'm going to do the back end, like everything. Exactly. Right? I don't exactly. want to know that. I just thought it's you to them and say, this is what I want to do. Yeah. In this case, even though I'm a tech person, I'm a business owner here. Yeah. Because, and I'm a product owner. I just basically told them, this is what I want. And they have to then go and look at my website and see what needs to change. They mm -hmm. can back to the coach and say, coach, um, went into your website, we're adding this new page, but then we have to make a change to this part and all of that. Exactly. Right? That's like, and that's kind of like business analysis. Exactly. Right. So, so thank you so much. Let's go mm -hmm. to the next question. And please, like I, I said, please, folks, um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in Slido. I hope someone can drop. So the Slido has been dropped in the chat. And any question. So what we've just done for this panel is I've really brought out questions that will evoke deep thought for my for 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 our panelists here but any question above and beyond this please feel free to drop it in the chat when we get mm -hmm. to the q a session we will touch on it so you know you were talking about collaboration with product owners mm -hmm. one of the things i find when i do this session is that somehow the questions kind of are connected right exactly yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're talking about collaboration with product owners because we know that the product owner and the ba 
closely work together. Mm -hmm. Fact, a better career progression for a BA is actually to grow into a product, product owner. owner. True. Some that's the better career product um, progression in my mind. And some will be like, but coach, you be a BA. Why are you not a scrum master? Story for another day. <laughs> That's, I, I I wanted to go back into product because I used to be a product owner. But unfortunately, sometimes in Canada, what you've done last always follows you around. Because I was always on Scrum Team. Like, yeah. Oh, come on, come on, come on. And I was like, no, I want to be a product owner. But that's, that's <laughs> a story for another day. But I don't even mind because I could fit into both roles anyway. But a very good career progression for a business analyst is to become a product owner. Why? Because any product owner who become any product, any BA that called a product owner, I always call them a rock star product owner. Product owner, Anywhere. true. That is because true. They, they are so good. They would add value when they are creating user stories, when they are working with the team. They understand what they're doing. They're not just business people, right? So I just want to challenge you here. In case you're a BA, think of becoming a product owner. You might think it's hard, but I always tell you there's a lot more money in that in that direction, right? <laughs> but let's just go back to the question. In what ways can business analysts and product owners collaborate effectively in a scrum team to ensure a balanced focus on both technical needs, on, on business needs and technical feasibility? How can a business, how can, because I'm a product owner, I want you to do A, that's what I want, but A might not be technically feasible at that point in time. Mm -hmm. or even if it was feasible, it would cost a lot time, more money yeah. to implement, a lot yeah. more time, mm -hmm. budget, effort. Maybe we don't have the skills and all of that, right? So how do they collaborate effectively on a scrum team to ensure a balanced focus on both what the business wants and the technical feasibility of implementing the change? Yeah, so that, that that's um, that's a very good one. Um, area to look into because what I found is, um, you know, in my own experience and in all some other people's experience, and not you're not necessarily junior to me, but some of the feedback I've gotten is that there are some BAs that you know when you you have a re requirement gathering session, you jump at setting your requirements gathering session, your workshop, your chat session, and all of that. It's very important for the business analyst to have a, a, a meeting or a sit up with the product owner to understand the mindset behind a product roadmap or the next vision of that product or maybe the backlog items. It's very important because um, even though a business analyst might not be there right when they're drawing up the product vision and all of that, usually the product owners, they're like, they have more, a, a more strategic look at the, at how the product impacts on the organization. So even if a BA wasn't in those meetings, those big meetings with the big guys, the business analyst needs to take up the product. There must have been some documentation, you know, in that journey, in drawing up the product journey or the product roadmap. So the, the, the onus is on the, pro, the BA to take up such a slide, like a deck, and understand every nitty gritty about how that product, you know, what, what the expected journey for that product or whatever the, let me say the new epic, let me, let me use the word epic. So a epic in itself is like a requirement that can be, you know, can be broken down into um, little user stories. So the product, the business analyst has to be in sync, has to understand the mindset behind existing product documentations. Remember I said that this product documentation, documentation just might be three slides on a PowerPoint. It could be actually a product backlog that you inherited from the product owner. And then because the product owner is now doing a more, is now taking up a more strategic role, then you as a BA are expected to jump on it and start, you know, all of those things. So that's speaking to the product owner to understand the mindset behind the product journey or the epic or the user story is very paramount to the success of a BA. You understand? So it's not, uh, oh, I have the requirement workshop. I have my questions outlined. I know what to ask the business people. No, you have to be in sync with the product owner. I hope I'm making some sense, Pamela. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also want to talk about the consultative part of being a, a, a BA. Yeah. Right? You know, some BAs, um, some BAs are, they think their role is to be a yes person to business. To whatever, yes. Whatever so sometimes want. you can also be a consultant to say, I know you want to do it like this. 
we've done our analysis. These are the possibilities. These mm -hmm. are all of the, these are the options. Mm -hmm. but this, in this option, we think this option is good because of X, right? Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that um, BAs have to start to think about. You're a consultant. Um, and I always tell people it's about how you frame the language, how you frame your, your recommendation. It's the way you write that you get results. Sometimes people are like, oh, I said it and they push back. It has happened to me. I see something and it's not done. And then three, two months after, they're doing the same thing I said because someone else said it a different way. Exactly. I don't feel good about it. But what I just learned, I get pissed sometimes, but I'm like, you know what? Next <laughs> time, either I shout the loudest or I sit back and present the justification yeah. very clearly, very succinctly mm -hmm. with, with an idea in mind that I want to get this result. Okay. So as a business analyst, you should also be a consultant, yeah. right? Consultant. These are the options. But this option one, seems to be the best because of x y z yeah so clearly stated that you, want mm -hmm. to, you want to bring as a b it also mm -hmm. lets you add body people start to trust in your competence mm -hmm. they start to like they look up to you more they can even like give you more responsibility mm -hmm. which can also lead you to getting promoted mm -hmm. getting um uh, accolades you know whatever because at the end of the day we come in here to, to, to make money, but we also mm -hmm. want to make more money. We want to feel appreciated, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. want to grow. Mm -hmm. And not only just grow, as a BA, you also want to know that your work matters. It gives you that whole sense of fulfillment. When fulfillment. Like, wow. Very key. I recommended Very key. this thing. Very and they key. Did that, right? So great. So like just to, just to wrap it up, right? The BA mm -hmm. and the product owner work very, very closely, mm -hmm. right? I train people a lot on Scrum. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to be launching rolling out our business analysis course mm -hmm. so later in the year. But I trained, I, I, but people are like, um, but, um, coach, what is the difference between a product owner and a BA? And I'm like, two different mindsets. Yeah. Two different skill sets. Mm -hmm. The business analyst focuses on requirements. They don't prioritize. They yeah. don't do all of that. Mm -hmm. Their work is, this is what we're trying to do. They go and do analysis, come up with requirements. I'll, yeah. How can we get, how can we deliver on yeah, this requirement? Yeah. Get confirmation. Everybody's on the same page. They're like, yeah, this is what we want to do. Okay, yeah. great. Developers, take, go do it. And of course, as a B, you don't go do it and then walk away and buy. Of course, you interact with your developers. Mm -hmm. They'll have questions. You help to answer questions. Sometimes mm -hmm. you step in as a as a as as the as the product owner, sometimes when they're not available. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's go. Sorry, to Pam question. Pamela, before we go to the next question, All right. um, you know, you, you mentioned something about giving a justification to your recommendations. And honestly, I there is there is a terminology that you know business analysts and product owners they, 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 they use, but people don't see it as a very big, a very important, you know, factor or element in, in your success, whatever mm -hmm. role you are in. And that is credibility. I've seen some job, you know, job description where you say, oh, um, requirements or what does it take to deliver on the job? Credibility to do this and this. So the word credibility, it's not just about your look and feel, not just how people see you, how you come across to them in your physical appearance. Credibility in terms of the justification Pamela mentioned, like how you're able to, I'm sorry, some, some business analysts cannot even deliver on the decision table appropriately. Why are we making, why are we going for solution A? rather than solution B, why not solution C? You understand? So you have to table your options of in a solution set or solution options in such a way that it is clear for anybody to read, pick up that document, pick up your decision table, your table and say, oh, we're going for B because it satisfied this and this. So that comes back to doing your own homework as a business analyst. You can't be in a space and don't understand how the payment system, you cannot be working as a business analyst for a top bank and you don't even understand how the payments eco ecosystem works you understand so that's that's very important for you to learn and unlearn some things as a business analyst exactly so there's some things that you can learn on in training and there's some things you have to learn for yourself yes right? you have to go and do your it's research. very important awesome so let's talk about handling projects obviously business analysts they're on scrum teams they work with product owners but they actually do they do real projects right if you are fortunate, I've coached some people who the first job they get, they'll be like, they'll come to you and say, Coach, 
I don't really have much I'm doing. The project is simple. Half of the time I'm sitting down, not doing anything, and there are BAs. I'm like, I'm like, you're fortunate because my first BA <laughs> job in this country kept me up at night. <laughs> kept me up at night. Because I started day one on the project. It was the biggest project. I don't want oh to my. talk about name. It was the big, oh. biggest project that their retail bank had. And it was for the biggest retailer in the world. You guys know who the biggest retailer in the world is, right? Mm -hmm. But an Amazon project. And that project kept me up at night. Even as a trained BA, I still had to <laughs> do another course. That I paid 4000 US dollars for. And it was not a course where I was talking to the... I didn't pay for a course where I was going to be talking to the <laughs> trader. Because I didn't have the time. I was like, I'm on this project. I'm lacking in these areas. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can self save I pay for K for, for, mm -hmm. for videos. So anyway, moving on. But we all know that as BAs, most likely you're going to be on a complex project. Mm -hmm. If you are fortunate to be on less complex project, you're lucky. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. most of the time. So yeah. when you to be a BA, look beyond the money. Because the money is great. Trust me. <laughs> But the stress is real, right? It's they real. expect, like I said, they are consultative, they are recommending. They are expecting a thorough professional, right? So how, as a business analyst, for complex projects with multiple stakeholders and evolving requirements, how can they be help to maintain clarity and focus within the Scrum team? I think it is very powerful because we know that when you're on the complex project that is very ambiguous, a lot of times you can find yourself spinning. Every time, like you're going around in a rabbit hole, you have one meeting and another. It's like that meeting did not yield any results. You are going back and forth. How does a BA stay resilent mm -hmm. in the face of such projects to help to maintain clarity and focus? Because when it comes to requirement, the BA is the owner. At the end yeah. of the day, no matter how complex it is, it still falls on the BA to ensure working with the product owner to get the that 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 the requirements out at some point in time and provides the scrum team to help them get clarity. So how do you think that a scrum master, I mean sorry, a BA can help to maintain that clarity and focus within the scrum team for complex projects? Yeah. So um yeah for me I I I don't believe so much in um techniques and tools. My for as a BA or in my space, my biggest assets are the people I have. So what I realize is that a lot of BA, they're like, especially when you're new to it, not when you're, when you're experienced, you should know that interaction with your stakeholders, having a good relationship with people, you know, would go a long way in you achieving success. But for new BAs, they're so cramped up in that space, especially for remote jobs and even some in-person um, jobs. They're so cramped up in that space of, who I, I have to know how to use my JIRA. I have to know all the nitty gritty of conference. I have to know the different ways of doing some, <laughs> some workflows on SharePoint. Speak to people, interact with the people. And that is why RSI cannot be overemphasized. Know the stakeholders that are you know, responsible for some things that are accountable that are, you know, you just need to inform some people. So some people, they have to give you their confirmation, their approval. You understand? So as a BA, handling complex projects starts with understanding the people that matter. Who are the people that will have, you know, impact? Who are going to make approvals? Who are the people you're trying to satisfy with this project? Who are the product owners in court or the business owners or the system owners that are going to be impacted by this project or by this system or by this product, whatever it is. And then at the point at the end, you know, at, at the end user aspect, you might not have a direct end user. Who are the indirect end users that are going to be feeding on information? So I feel that if a BA is able to answer the question of who, understanding the RISI tool, like go and read about RISI, how to de determine um, the person who should speak to regarding you know, these, who is accountable, who is responsible, who is just, who requires just consultation, just consult with this person, who just needs to be informed. If you can do that recite properly, and even um, for project management students, what one thing they realize is if you're very good at doing your recite, I would say half of your problem is solved because you can't know it all, right? Especially when you work for big organizations that have monster applications that have enterprise resource planning applications speaking to what <laughs> as you have your oracle net suit speaking to your salesforce your salesforce is talking to you know dynamics and all of that you have to you have to embrace 
people resources, the people you, you, you have, because you can't know it all. Trust me, that data engineer, that architect that has been in the organization for like five years or six years is a great asset to you more than spending days learning how to use some tool or some technique or some application that is just sitting there that doesn't have mouths to talk unless you're doing AI, right? Because I know that artificial intelligence is another level, right? Because people have fed it with a lot of data and then it's not able to give you some, you know, some results based on um, what it's being fed. So I would say that understanding the people that matter in a project will go a long way in you successfully delivering on your deliverables as a BA, right? So um, there, there, are number of, there are a number of things that could help, right? But Raise that recite to understanding some people are in a team. Some people are in a team and they don't even know who is the who is the chief architect, who is the engineer for a particular system, right? That's not right. Try as much as possible to go out of your comfort zone in looking at all this when you have meetings of say like 20 people, 25 people or more. How do each of these people contribute? That's one thing I do, especially in meetings where they just tell me to jump on, jump on this meeting. I try to go to the name of each person on Zoom and look at their role. Okay, oh, so this person is actually the senior manager for blah, blah, blah. Oh, so this person is the product owner for... That helps me in my thinking and directing my questions to... Because for a project, for a complex project, trust me, you cannot know it all. You are not the alpha and omega of a particular um, of business analysis. So even as you grow in your career, you learn, right? But the faster way to learn is learning from other people. And how can you how can you put yourself in a situation where you people are able to open up to you and help you to grow in your career? I don't see you as the see you as a, as a team member rather than. Um, a competitor, right? It's very important that the other person is not seeing you as a competitor. You're just not getting information from them to shine, right? You're indeed interested in the success of the project. It's by interacting with people. So as a BA, your people skill has to be top notch. You have to be warm towards people. You have to gain credibility from people based on understanding what you're talking about. You're not just coming there to give them to speak English, like you're the best English speaker in, <laughs> in the world. No, you're mm -hmm. coming to put value, to add value to whatever meetings mm -hmm. you are. So for complex project, trust me, you can know it all. You cannot have everything. Just ensure that you're talking to the right people. Thank you. I like that. So I, yeah. I like how you mentioned, you know, people, because that's where, that's your source. What yeah. point, I'm like, I'm like, I always tell people, if you're going to be a BA, be ready to have meetings or meetings. If you don't like having meetings, it's not the career for you, right? Exactly. So you already mentioned, the, having the race is a technique. That's one of the first things I always, when I coach people, when I do one-on-one -on -one coaching, for especially for BAs and commerce, I say the first thing you need to do on the job is find out who's on the project. Who do you need exactly. to do? And then start to write it down. You might go yes. and say, can you give me a race in your organization? And nobody's going to give you one. <laughs> You're going to have to create your own reason. That's yeah. it, right? And like I mentioned, like, you know, your people's skill, your ability to build positive relationships will yeah. also serve you well, a lot. Now, your 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 ability to, first of all, do documentation is another skill I want to mention. You know how um, sometimes you go for a meeting, after people finish talking, nothing was achieved. Yeah. They come back the next day, they do that, but they don't... <laughs> There are no notes from the last session where everyone's confused about what we did not know. They come again, right? As a BA, you can bring clarity of focus by one, being organized. A key skill of a BA, if you want to start, even if you're not good at analysis or anything, those are still emerging skills. Think about the skills you still have right now. Those two, that's a technique, right? Being organized. Okay, we have a meeting. I'm going to make sure I come, I take notes. I'm going to make sure I document open questions. I'm going to send it. They are bringing clarity, they are bringing focus because then people can then remember this is what we talked about last meeting. This is where we where we got stuck. And then you can continue to do that. But imagine when everybody's confused, they don't know what's going on. And then even you two, you don't know what's going on. Then when people come, you're like, we talked about that two weeks to be like, really? For real? Did we? Right? Some of those things. Then it's from there you start to emerge. There's all other tools that you can use to also help people like figure out. And, and because once you start to do that, then suddenly you start to find, like, as you mentioned, people, by the time we now come together, these are our takeaways, these are the questions we have. 
then you can bring focus to that meeting on where those areas mm -hmm. that people don't have clarity. And then you can then from there start to figure out, do I need to create a, a scope document because we don't re we're not really sure of the scope, exactly. step diagram, you know, all of that fun stuff, right? Um, Pamela, another thing I wanted to add is, um, you know, you find out that as a business analyst or whoever, whoever you are, if you're doing a documentation, people are more receptive of that documentation. They are, are more, um, th there's, there's a higher possibility that they will embrace the documentation, give you accolades and make use of it when they are involved in creating such documentation, right? So you cannot just sit in your own silo and even you know the um, A, B, C to Z of a loyalty system, say, oh, I've done it before in my previous job. This is what to do, this is what to write. You have to learn to involve people in whatever um, awesome. doc working documents yeah, you have. So I want to be a question, but we'll go back to our screen because okay. we have two more questions. Um, I'll, we have two more questions to go. So I'm going to log into my slider and check that out. So let's talk about incorporating customer feedback. You know, our customers can be anybody. You know, when people think of customers, yeah. in the world, they're thinking really of like a customer who's buying some products, right? Yeah. So, but our customers are also like people inside our organization that we serve, right? Mm. As it is. So how can a being play a pivotal role in incorporating, in integrating customer feedback into the development process within the constraints of a sprint, right? Yeah. Um, um I, I, I'll just elaborate a bit more here, right? Because we're getting customer feedback in Scrum, especially during demos, right? When we do demos, when we do our sprint reviews, we get feedback, right? And so as a BA, what is your role in integrating that feedback into a development process? And how yeah. does it impact like upcoming sprints and things like that? and its impact on the backlog and sprint planning. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. So um, I would like to say first of all that because when people say, when, when, when a lot of people hear the word feedback, they quickly think change. Oh, I'm getting feedback from my customers or from stakeholders and they want me to change something. No, not, it's not always the same stem, the, the, the state. So it's not always that your customer feedback, it's, it's tending towards you changing something, whatever has been delivered for that sprint. So using practical examples. So for example, I deliver on user acceptance testing, right? I want to believe, Pamela, correct me if I'm wrong. I want to believe that's what you mean by demo, right? When you demo, whatever it's coming up in the next product release. So, yes. yeah. So let's imagine that I just delivered on my user acceptance testing and I have my feedback. Most of the time, not all of the time, most of the time, the feedback are going to be, okay, yes, it's been done right. No, this wasn't done correctly, which is usually, which is supposed to be minimal. If you've actually gathered um, your requirements correctly, you've done proper analysis and the developers understand what's supposed to be delivered. You're not supposed to get a lot of, uh, no, wrong, entirely wrong. This wasn't what we asked for. Ideally, it shouldn't be, but you might have one or two of that. Then most, the ones I've found that from experience that you get a lot is, incremental change like enhancements to what you have before so what what you've what you're about you know delivering in the next release so remember what i said about the people skill people skill for a ba is supposed to be top notch your people skills are supposed to be top notch in such a way that you're able to manage your stakeholders to let them understand that okay so you wanted um, a white and black um, paper and we've given you a white and black paper, but then we did it horizontally. So you're now saying that you also want another one that is gonna be vertical, you know, white and black stri stripes. So what you can tell them is that, okay, for this release, this current release may be planned for the next two days or three days or whenever. Can we give you that first leg? Trust us that in the next release or whenever, when after you'd gotten back to your, um, your Scrum, same. Trust us that we're going to factor in this increment, this enhancement that you want, and we're going to give it to you at the earliest possible time. It, it may not be the, the subsequent, like the immediate next release. It could be like two releases after. But the ability to assure your, your stakeholders, and 
I want to say something that, you know, all the kind of, all the this, all this case studies or the, the kinds of examples I'm giving right, right here, they are very good for your interview. They are very good things for your interview process because you're able to give real life scenarios of how are you able to, you know, pacify an angry stakeholder. You understand? So incorporating the feedback necessarily is not, um, oh, what we've done, what the, what the, scrum team has done for the past two weeks is wasn't accepted or was not acceptable no it's more of um making your stakeholders customers see value in what the team has been working on it's very important because on one hand as you're trying to satisfy the customer you are also trying to protect the interests you know let the pe let people see value in what the developers have been working on, what the team has been working on. So as you're trying to assure them that, okay, this is what you've said, you want this to be changed, um, as this so, 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 and so enhancement, let them appreciate how what you've delivered ties in into what they've requested. You understand? So um, reason why I'm going nitty gritty and saying all of these words is we have to understand that foundationally, ideally, you shouldn't provide you shouldn't deliver a product or a requirement that is that that is that has nothing to what, do with what the customer has given you in the first place or what the stakeholder has presented exactly. to you. Yeah, it shouldn't yeah, happen. That, that, I, ideally, it shouldn't happen. Yeah, but of if course. It, but if, yeah. well, if, if it happens, I think as a scrum master and a product owner, we'll have to go and do a retrospective and see why were we off base, right? Why? Yeah. Why yeah. were we off base? Yeah. So um, I just want to, you know, just to wrap it up, because we're going to the last question and then we'll take anybody's an question and answers, right? Um, the thing that I just wanted to I, I just wanted to highlight, right, is of course you take that feedback, we know where it's going to go, it's going to go into the product backlog. Mm -hmm. Then working with the the product owner to say, is this a change that we want to implement, right? Mm -hmm. I will mean, a change I want to implement, making sure it's prioritized, of course. Having conversations with the, the development team to say, mm -hmm. what would it take to deliver this? This, How exactly. Can we deliver like all those interactions are super, super important. They're yeah, important. So yeah. what, at the last question, and I li really like this one. That's why I left it for, for the last one. The future. So this last question, future trends and challenges. Mm -hmm. Looking ahead, what emerging trends do you foresee in the field of business analysis with analysis. agile environment? What are the biggest challenges BAs may face and how can they prepare to meet this challenge? Why I say that is that whatever skills you think you have today, mm -hmm. keep on becoming obsolete. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I look at folks who either they're trying to become BAs for the first time or they were BAs before in a different continent and they want to come into this into this environment yeah. and get jobs. And I look at their resume and I tell them, I'm sorry, I'm going to be blunt. I don't want to make you feel bad. <laughs> That's why I look at your resume. This is why you're not getting jobs. Your only skill on this resume that I can see is just that you have BA certification. <laughs> That's all it is. So if you're sending, I always tell people, the way I apply for jobs is if they ask for 10 things, I want to have most of those 10 things. Yeah. I'm not going to send my resume with just one thing and hope that, that, I get, they, that you get an interview. I yeah. always say to people, if you want to get a job, think like a competitor, like you're mm -hmm. going to a race. Mm -hmm. In the race is the people who prepared on time, the ones who got all the training, spent money on the highest coaches, train, 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 that can get in. Luck happens, but it's luck. It's very rare. So and it happened. So if you are a BA, you're looking to get into business analysis, or you're a BA, you're looking to maybe... Maybe because the industry you are in is not as high paying or there are not a lot of jobs. So you're not mobile because you know you want us to be mobile. You want to be able to move around within industries. This is what you want to pay attention to about the future and trends, right? Mm -hmm. So first of all, let's talk about what you see are the emerging trends to pursue in the field of business analysis. Um. Yeah, so... <laughs> I love the word imagine trends and not like future, like whatever, because... I'm not the alpha and omega. <laughs> it's only God that is the alpha and omega that knows the beginning and the end. But I love the terminology that you've put there, Pamela. That is emerging. So right now, what I hear is a lot of artificial intelligence and generative AI. And that's why you see a lot of organizations talking big about the data scientists. I think currently my team, team 
I believe we like I, I get to see a lot of um, job postings, like just the internal recruitment recruitment for a lot of data data scientists, data and engineers, data architects, right? Because at the end of the day, generative AI and AI, at least that's what they're talking about right now, would require the skill set of those people. It will require the skill set of the product designers because whatever goes on at the background is data. How the customer perceive it and make use of it and the experience that the, that the customer has is the work of the designers. So as a PA, you might not, when you take up trainings, you, you may not uh, like kind of like have the depth knowledge, in-depth knowledge of data analysis, of data science, of generative AI, but you shouldn't look away from that. Whatever, 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 um, let me say, whatever subject is emerging in your field or in your industry, you have to at least have an hour, <laughs> sit out and understand the concept. That I don't want to believe at this age, at this time and age, we still have BAs who don't understand as it the basic, basic of what machine learning is. You understand? So things like artificial intelligence, things like generative AI, you have to understand the concept behind it. Maybe not nitty gritty. Oh, does it mean that, okay, there are actually some historical data or some real, real time data that some system or the machine tries to interpret and then give some predictive analysis? You know, you should be comfortable using those terminologies. Maybe not as accurate as the specialists, right? But you have some basic knowledge. You are not lost in the room when they're talking about how generative AI will impact your process or how generative um, AI can put your product forward to be competitive in the market. You shouldn't be lost. So that's what I will say that, um, you know, regardless of whether you're practicing agile or waterfall in your organization, you should like put yourself up to speed with all these things we're talking about, AI, generative AI, and read, read, different things from the internet, read from Gartner, read from Deloitte, read from the top consulting organizations, you know. So you don't have to like dedicate a whole week to learn. I think as a business analyst, one of the challenges is creating time to get ourselves up to speed with the new technologies because you have to be comfortable with those terms. Even if you cannot explain it nitty gritty, just like I've not been able to explain it in the nitty gritty way, but at least you have an understanding of what it is. Are you able to, you know, Thank you. I, I think you said right. it beautifully. Yeah. You said it beautifully. I love everything you said. Like we all know that artificial intelligence is coming, guys. Mm -hmm. And what I always say to people, I always say this to, to people, I always like have an anecdotal thing to say to people. You see, every time in the world, events happen that change the trajectory or change how we see the world. Mm -hmm. And most times, most of we in the world ignore it. The people who embrace it, who we call early adopters, mm -hmm. come in, adopt it, and get the best out of it before the rest of the people start to play catch up. And then suddenly the field is saturated and you're just really just trying to get a piece of the cake. But the people who took it, who, who got into it first, have gotten the best of it, are now experts, right? And you're struggling. Yeah. And we don't have any more, more excuse in the world. That was fine when information was not as available as mm -hmm. it is right now on the internet, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But in today's world, information is so readily available. Yeah. And the fact that a lot of people are on one social media platform or, or, or the other, there are very few people here who can see they're not on any social media platform. So okay, if you have true. time to scroll through gossip columns on Instagram... <laughs> and digesting that information because what I would like to know, our phones take more most of our times and it's all these things. Then, if you have that time, you need to also make out time for knowledge. Artificial intelligence is going to be a game changer mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. period. The people mm -hmm. who get in today, today as we speak, are the ones who will be the luckiest people. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the knowledge is not so readily available. Yeah. It's not so well developed. So mm -hmm. if you are a half-baked artificial AI person, you will get into the door. Mm -hmm. But you see the main then, but give it 10 years, then the skills are solid. The bar has been raised. Yeah, true, very true. You're gonna have to like take it up a notch. Artificial yeah. intelligence is so so great. 
I'll just give you, like she mentioned, examples, right? Also, practical examples is how do you as a BA use artificial intelligence in your day to day? Mm -hmm. like day? Mm -hmm. It's not just okay to say, I don't know this thing. Have you tried yeah. to do any Have you tried, like, yeah. ChatGPT, mm -hmm. like, um, I don't know, is it Copilot? What does what, what they have on Bing now? Microsoft, I don't know if it's Copilot or the other one, Copilot, right? Um, how do you use it in your job to be more efficient? Get comfortable with it. Learn it because by the time you keep on using it, you get better. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So mm -hmm. think about how ways as a BA that AI can simplify things for you. You can feed it data and tell it to analyze something, give you insights. You might be a BA and you're on the job. You're supposed to send emails to senior people and they've told you to send emails to senior people. Trust me, you do not want to make a mistake with that audience. You don't come back from it. Because they don't really interact with you. You make one mistake, that's what stays in their mind. Maybe you use your AI to say, okay, I want you to send out these meeting notes and I have VPs and directors here. You can tell your AI to help you craft it for that audience, right? You can do a lot of things, things that you don't know. That's one, right? She mentioned data analysis. I mean, back in the day, you could get away with not <laughs> knowing data analysis, like me, because I hate data. But these days you can't. You are most likely going to be on a project where data analysis is involved. So you need to understand some level of data analysis. You don't have to be an expert in it, but at least understand it at the basic level. Right? And sorry, um, Pamela to had the basic level could just be understanding Excel. Something as simple as VLOOKUP, your formulas. You understand? It's I believe that um having two or three YouTube going through two or three YouTube videos can help you in understanding how to use Excel efficiently. You know how to do your VLOOKUPs, you can your charts, your graphs could help a lot, especially when you're doing a lot of data um cleansing from you know taking out data from maybe like a legacy application to a modern application, things like that. And then you can now take it further, understanding SQL knowing how to exactly. join tables and all of that. But for you to now say that, no, I'm shying away from that. You may not necessarily, you know, be a exactly. successful BA. Yeah, with, with just sitting down and not doing anything about data. And so, yeah, so as a BA, make sure you are subscribing to good, great newsletters, right? Mm -hmm. Make sure you are following the right people on the call, on, on, on your social media platforms, like your, actually your professional ones, like LinkedIn, you know, read. It's very hard as adults to make out time to read 100% because you are busy, yeah. right? But make out that time because that's how you know when the needle is moving yeah. and, and and you can get that information. 30 minutes a day, 30 minutes a week, yes. one hour a month is better than nothing at all. Right? nothing at all. So no, any closing words um, before I want to go to question, Any anything to wrap up before we go to question and answers. So I, I don't see any questions yet. If you don't have, if you didn't, if you missed it, please go here and, add your questions. Otherwise, if you have any question, you can raise your hands up and we can take it and make it interactive. Any any final words, um, Titi? Uh, well, <laughs> final words. I, I just try to encourage people, don't be too hard on yourself. The truth is life is more than career building. You have your family, you have what you really, there's some, um, let me say, what I call them, what you like to do at your spare time. Sometimes for some people, their job is their passion, but don't be too hard on yourself. Take it one step at a time. Like Pamela said, one hour a week or one hour a month is better than nothing at all. The most important thing is that you're taking baby steps towards getting better at what you love to do. And while we know that money is important and could actually be a driving force to coming into the space of project management, business analysis, data analysis, and all of these things, most importantly, at the end of the day, what's important is your self-actualization. I see, Pamela, have we met in person? I don't think so. No, we right? did. We actually we did. met. We really? Forgot. No, I know that. Yeah. When, I, when I first started my speaking career in Canada, I folk, PNP, I folk, oh yeah, okay, I think I remember. December. Anyway, yeah, my my that point was really time. We have not yeah, met my point really is that we've had a lot of virtual connections more, yeah. like WhatsApp, and I can get into our space and all of that because I, I see her as someone like who has who's, she's intentional. She has passion for what she's doing, and that's one thing we also have in common, apart from having a background in tech. You have to be passionate about what you're doing. If on the long run, you, you step into this BA thing and you think it's not working for you, then at the end of the day, go towards something that we equally put, that we equally put food on your table and will give you your personal fulfillment. You know, we shouldn't take that away. 
everybody cannot, we all <laughs> cannot be cannot be business analysts and project managers. But if you're loving it, put in a step, one step into the waters and you're loving it, then you're encouraged. Please, you must, you must be up for the challenge. You, ca you can't just be getting all those six figures and seven figures for nothing. <laughs> yeah, you have exactly. to, yeah, you all have right. to put in the Thank work. Thank you so you much. So, in the work. T -T, uh, I, I forgot to get your contact. Can you put in the chat, like your oh. LinkedIn? Oh, uh, yeah. LinkedIn, how people can con contact you on LinkedIn so that they can no, get we'll it. Just, so any I'm questions for, from anybody on the call? Any questions? I don't see anything in Slido. Yet, any questions at all about what we talked about about BA? Any, any, any questions? Any comments or any input? Don't be shy because this is your opportunity. This is this is all free. This is your opportunity to ask any question at all. Let me see if there's any question in the chat. If you have any question, please raise your virtual hands up. up yeah, so my like... my, uh, my name on LinkedIn is Titilokwe Taiwo. Then um, if you have a couple of, if you have other Titilokwe Taiwo's, then you see all of this. Um, can you labels. copy the link? If you can get the link and drop oh, it. Oh, yeah, me. I can do that. I can That'll copy the link. Feel free to message me, connect with me. Let me do that right now. Okay, so... Okay, since we don't have any questions from anybody, I'll just wrap up. We're just going to wrap up now. We're finishing um, early. So just to wrap up to say that if you are interested in Scrum training, feel free to reach out to us. Um, contact details will be shared in the chat. I believe they're being that, that in the chat. Um, so we have a training that's coming up next week. It's um, a six-week Scrum training that is practical-based. So what does this mean? It's 25% theory, 75% practical. You actually get to be a scrum master for one month. I really believe in practical training. I don't, I'm not a theory person. I don't know how to theor, theor, theoritize. It's not my way of teaching. So you actually get to do the work, use the real tools that's coming up. Um, and you can see everything that you're going to get from this training, access to the training videos. You have access to one month practical training. I have a thriving Scrum Master community on WhatsApp where we support ourselves. You also get two free templates that I've created myself. So what I do when I train is I think of when I got trained and some of my pain points after I got trained and like, if I had gotten this, I think my career would have been better. So I personally <laughs> put myself in my own shoes of what I thought I needed when I finished my training. And I created a checklist for you of what you will do in your first month as a Scrum Master. Very simple. Also created a 10 page ebook of when you get into the office without talking to your friend as a scrum master, without talking to even me, if I coach you, you can actually book your scrum event without talking to me. Everything there is just copy and paste, book your meeting. And then of course we offer post-training support, um, helping you craft a winning scrum master resume and preparing you for your interview. So we have two trainings, there's a six week one. If you are someone who doesn't, who is not interested in the practical training, and we, I, I forgot to mention that payments and installments are available. If you are someone who is not interested in the practical training, we have a more shorter training that is four, four days and it's $500. So that four day training, you have you still have access to the Scrum training videos. You have access to our community. You also have access to one single um, resume review, but there's no practical here. So in the chat, you can, you'll find how to connect with us, you can connect with us um, via our um, social media handles, websites, WhatsApp, and all of that. If you have any questions that occur to you after the training, feel free. And then also I'm writing a book that's coming up soon. Uh, that's wow. my, how I write. So that's the icon for my upcoming book, um, Leading Ladies in Technology you also have a chance to sign up to be aware uh, when the book launches and every other announcement that has to do with my book launch. So I want to thank you all for really hanging out with us today. I hope we added value. Uh, I hope you've been more aware from a an actual um, practical perspective about a Scrum, I'm uh, sorry, about a BA's role in a Scrum team. And not only that, Maybe we've actually evoked more questions in you. 
which is a good thing. Curiosity <laughs> thing, yeah. is a beautiful thing, right? So feel free to interact with us. Feel free to send any questions, of course. And please feel free to give us feedback or put in the chat any other topics that you want to hear. These topics are free of charge. I'm doing it free of my, my time. Titi is also doing it free um, of our time. So we really want to build a community of tech people to thrive by bringing these trainings, um, these free webinars to you so that you can keep learning, keep getting information, keep networking because now you know Titi, you can reach out to her and say, oh, I was on that call where you were. I attended, I really liked your speech where you said X, Y, Z. And you never know the opportunity that would happen. I'm hoping that in the future, in the summer, we can actually create like an actual um, webinar where people can really network, you know, just, not just beyond, not just beyond, you know, hearing people talk and all of that. Like we really want people to start to connect, share their experiences, experiences be vulnerable, yeah. right? And learn from each other. That's the community that I'm trying to build here. And I want, thank you so much, Titi, for your time. It's a um, pleasure. <laughs> it's a pleasure. So I am so impressed about how your career is growing from when we met from the one when we moved to Canada till now, it's been one success to the next. And I'm looking forward to what the future holds for you.